taught to love our enemies, regardless of how difficult that may be. It's not just loving your neighbors you get along with, but it's the neighbors that you don't see eye to eye with. Well, guys, welcome back to the Kingdom Business Podcast. Uh, I've got a wonderful guest with me today, uh, a guest that you're going to learn an awful lot from. Uh, he's got a big worldview. Uh, he's quite challenging in his approach and, and what he fills his day with. Um, and it's really going to stretch your capacity to think. He's a man with big vision. Uh, he's obviously able to execute on phenomenal vision and, uh, and at the same time, incredibly humble. So this one is going to be interesting. Uh, my guest today, Bill Yo, is the, a third generation entrepreneur um, and his business today, Day and Zimmerman, um, based out of the US, would be in one of the largest privately held businesses in the US with annual revenues nudging $3 billion and a team headcount of like 45,000 people. And amongst all of this, He's a radical minister who absolutely loves Jesus with a master's in theology and ministry at the same time. He's got a book out. We're going to talk about that. It is going to be fantastic. Hey, Bill, why don't you introduce yourself to the Kingdom Business Podcast? Hey, Wes, uh, thank you so much for having me. And boy, very humbled by that rousing introduction. Thank you. But uh, it's my honor to be here. Uh, really respect your work and what you stand for and, and the difference you've made in the world. So, so thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you hit a lot of different things. I, I spent a lot of my uh, adult career in the business world, uh, working at our family business with my, uh, initially with my dad and then subsequently with my siblings. And, and you know, we continue to own and operate Day in Zimmerman. We're very, very proud of that and the difference that we think we make uh, in the world. And um, the last, I would say, half dozen or eight years, I've really started spending a lot more time pursuing my faith journey. Uh, which was precipitated, speaking of family, sadly, with my mom's passing. Um, but when my mom passed in the mid-2010s, um, it was a God moment for me. It was a presence of God moment for me at her passing when her suffering ended and she went to be home with the Lord. And, you know, since then, I've, I've gone through a, a series of progressively more, uh, uh, I guess, deliberate commitments to my faith journey as well as to my professional journey. And um, so I... I uh, Stopped a lot of my management responsibilities in the business. I'm still an owner and, and chairman of one of our companies, but uh, have focused a lot more on my writing and on faith. Uh, had a chance to re research and publish a book on my father, um, really speaking of entrepreneurship and kind of doing the family thing and the professional thing together. And by extension, that was about our family and our business and um, started to do some mission work uh, over the last several years. In fact, on my first mission trip was when I had this, this revelation, truly a revelation by the Holy Spirit to write a book on that mission trip. And that's the book that I've recently put out on Varnished Faith. Uh, and through all that, I actually uh, converted my denomination of Christianity from Episcopalian to Roman Catholic um, and uh, earned a master's in ministry and theology at Villanova, a Roman Catholic university here in, in Pennsylvania in the East Coast of the United States. And now I'm at a point where I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to talk about business, talk about faith, talk about some intersections on those things and uh, spend time with a lot of really interesting people like yourself. So thank you. Awesome. Now you mentioned writing and you mentioned your new book, Unvarnished Faith. We'll, we'll, we'll link it up um, so people can buy it. I think that's awesome. Um, give, it, give, us the, give us the skinny on it. Give us the synopsis. What, what's, uh, what's the core message you wanted to get out through that book? Sure. No, and, uh, and it was one of those things where I, I was my first mission trip that I ever went on. I went, uh, my brother and his wife started a food ministry called Servants with a Heart. And they packed meals, you know, by the by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and shipped them to underserved communities, both in the U.S., but, but a lot of them overseas. And Servants with a Heart's main recipient of, of food is Nicaragua. And so there's an organization, Nicaragua, who's our partner organization. And uh, several times a year, Servants with a Heart will run uh, missions down there to work with our local team and help hand out the food and, and help spread the word and um, build relationships with, with people. So after saying no for many times, I finally said yes to my brother's offer to go. And I went down uh, with a bunch of high schoolers. So ostensibly, I was going down as a chaperone to kind of help them do the mission work and, you know, have them do the God talk sort of stuff. Um, and uh, little did I know when I came back after six days, you know, my life was was really changed in terms of what I saw about um, just the dichotomy and the contrast of my very privileged world compared to the austere environment that I was in. And um, but you know, one of the things I say is that my privilege enabled me to go on the trip, but it also deluded me into believing I knew what made people rich. 
And when I was on this trip, I saw what true wealth looked like, and it's the wealth of love and the wealth of relationships. And uh, so I had a revelation halfway through that trip that I should write research and write a book about that trip. And so I did. And, um, you know, it's about learning to love with a servant's heart, uh, consistent with the food ministry. But the idea of unvarnished faith really speaks to the fact of, um, you know, we seem, particularly in the developed world, we spend so much time talking about division and talking about the things that separate us, whether it's, you know, up here, whether it's liberal, conservative down there, liberal or labor, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, you, you name the division, but even within our faith and even within Christianity, there's so much difference about, you know, denominational and doctrinal divides that while very important, in my opinion, are, are relatively small compared to the huge swaths of commonality we enjoy and, and we believe in that followers of Jesus Christ belief in the Holy Trinity, uh, belief that we should discern our talents and gifts to help others, belief in the dignity, the, the, God, the, the God-given dignity of all people. These are universal truths. And, and so this whole idea of unvarnishing the faith is, is stripping away all those doctrinal and denominational divides that, again, while important, take our eye off the main ball, which is life is only about love and relationships and how we connect with people. And I had the chance to put that into a book and and talk about my experience in Nicaragua and talk about mission and talk about food insecurity, but also talk about, in my opinion, what are some of the real core tenets that fuel love and relationships and lead to unvarnished faith. And so I, I talk about a number of different things throughout the book with that. So. Well, that's a good teaser. So we should all go and get a copy and, uh, and consume it. You know, it, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the podcast is because, you know, I mean, I knew from my research view that you are a Roman Catholic. It's like, we would agree on 99% of stuff. And over the other 1%, I don't think it's I don't think it's worth falling out over. You know, the writings of scripture don't get caught in petty fights over the law. Like, you, you know, so, so, but what I love about business people so much is I find that as a group, they tend to rise above a lot of the division because they're united by, by, by vision. You know, we may disagree on some things, but we would definitely agree on Jesus would be so good if he was at the center of the business world. You know, Jesus wants to love the lost and we can go and do it. And like, we would agree on so much high level stuff that it, it really isn't worth falling out over the little bit, you know. I remember years ago, this, this woman said to me, I believe Jesus was hung on a tree and not a cross. And I'm thinking, you couldn't get any closer. <laughs> like, like, okay, let's just agree, like whatever. Like, let's just get on with the job. And she was adamant yeah. that, you know, and I'm thinking it doesn't, what do you think the cross was made of? And so, you know, you know, and one of the things that I think we're gonna have to do as, as mature Christians is to put aside those divisions um, for the sake of advancing the kingdom. I mean, it's, you know, he, he didn't say sit around and prove each other right. He said, you know, go make disciples. And so, you know, that's why I was like, this this will be such a, a, a fruitful yeah. and rich conversation for well, me. And, and to your point, Wes, that you know, one of the things I also talk a lot is a lot of times when people get sort of, you know, hung up on on this thing that they're 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 so strongly committed to. A lot of it has to do with we have to go back to the way things used to be and and the way things and when when it was more, you know, when 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 things were more centered and more present and we've gotten away from these things and it's become secular and so divided and and pluralistic and. But the reality is, you know, Jesus's earthly ministry, yes, it was about recapturing the essence of the original scripture that had been lost, but it was also about creating an entirely new existence and an entirely new world that didn't exist. And so my belief in terms of moving forward is it's not just about going back. It's about how do we take the roots of what came from the back and move forward to create a new existence. And I, and I talk about in my book, you know, there's a very wonky business term called change management. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with it. You know, how do you manage change? How do you manage transformation in an organization, in a culture, in an industry? Well, I, I put forward in the book that I think Jesus Christ was the greatest change manager in the history of the world. So uh, Jesus Christ, the man, uh, you know, had an idea. He developed a, a very small group of followers and a very small group of disciples. He had an idea. He had a preaching. He had a ministry. That small group of people now accounts for almost two and a half billion committed believers worldwide. You know, that to me, sir, is, is change management uh, on steroids. It's successful change management, you could argue. Oh, hey, I hope you're enjoying this week's episode. Listen, I'm just here training a group here in this room, but I need you to subscribe to my channel. Guys, do you think they should subscribe to the channel? Yeah! Guys, please subscribe. Um, now, basically what you're talking about here is you're talking about 
taking the values of, of, of Scripture and the kingdom and, and putting them into the future, right, and what they look like today. So what are some of the values that you are taking and, and how do you put them to work on a daily basis? Sure. No, that, that's a, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, one of them for me at the very top of the list is dignity. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier about, you know, everybody is born with the God-given right to dignity. We were all created in the image of God, white, brown, black, gay, straight, male, female, somebody I see eye to eye with, someone who has a different worldview than I. Um, you know, we, we all have that God-given right to dignity. And how do we um, honor that right? How do we recognize that right? How do we celebrate that right in others, particularly in those people who we may not agree with? You know, we're, we're, we're taught to love our enemies regardless of how difficult that may be. It's not just loving your neighbors you get along with, but it's the neighbors that you don't see eye to eye with. And, and how do you not only love your enemy, how do you bestow grace and mercy on those who maybe, whether it's sort of competitively in the corporate world out to hurt you, or maybe more nefariously out to hurt you in other ways. So, and, and I really believe strongly in the dignity of work. And this is one of these examples where my personal ethos and my personal faith lens really shows up in, in the workplace without having to have Bible scripture hanging all over the walls of the office. And, and the whole idea of people deriving dignity from what they do, knowing that what they do matters, what they do makes a difference for others, what they do if you're in a leadership or a management position, how you're helping open doors and, and put food on the table and put roofs over heads of, of many, many people, how you're helping your customers achieve their objectives, uh, knowing that you're getting paid and valued for what it does. But there's so much dignity that is realized and infused from work when done properly. One of our businesses is a staffing company, the Yoke Company. And one of the things I love about being in the staffing business is we help people, we help match openings to, 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 to talent and people drive dignity from that. So that dignity would be a really important value for me in terms of uh, how my faith lens shows up in the, in the business world. Give, give me some others. What other values would you see that we should be living sure. out today? Yeah, no, I, you know, another one which is interesting that we don't talk a lot about is failure. Um, I, I dedicate a whole portion of the book to failure and, you know, so much in society and particularly, you know, in the developed world, whether it's U.S. or Australia or Western Europe or, or really anywhere for that matter. Um, you know, failure is such a, a negative thing, you know, it's that we avoid failure, particularly as, as parents. Um, you know, we don't want our kids to fail. We, we, you know, it's this everyone gets a trophy kind of kind of mentality. But there's so much value in failure. There's so much learning in failure. There's so much of a growth curve in failure. Um, and you know, so one of the things that I look at it, there's the there's the act of failing itself. There's the learning from the failing, and then there's the the process that connects all that. So, um, yeah, I was actually I've been fired twice in my life uh, from jobs. Um, so you know, both sort of by definition, those would be failures, and and you know, the details uh, are, are in the book, but. Um, you know, I learned more, particularly from one of those, in terms of my professional career and development than I did from any success that I ever had in my my career. So, you know, how do, of course, we want to keep our workers safe, both economically and physically. We want to keep our children safe physically and developmentally. But, but you know, I think failure is something that as, as a society, as a world, we, particularly as in the developed world, in the privileged world, we, we've lost the value and the focus uh, on failure as a value. You've mentioned privilege a few times. That'd be a trigger word for some people. Yes. Um, yeah, no, no doubt. Particularly three or four years ago during a presidential election, a year coming up, and and I talk about privilege a lot. And and I don't, I really don't view it as a political word. I view it as, um, you know, just, just very simply. I was born in the United States. I was born white, and I was born male. So th those three things right there, and to use a, a baseball term. They, that puts me on third base just just for showing up. So I, I'm I'm close to scoring that run just because of those things. And if I add to that that I was raised in a two parent household, I had the chance to receive a wonderful education all the way up through through graduate school a couple times. Um, we live socioeconomically comfortably. I'm Christian. I'm straight. I'm tall. Um, you know, I'm married. A any different way you look at it. Society is set. You're up getting, you're getting offensive now, Bill. All right, you, got, <laughs> you you tick too many of the boxes, right? So, right, <laughs> right. but but so uh, so when when the pandemic first hit, um, I became more aware of this than I ever had. So back in the spring of 2020, you know, recognizing that boy, we we, we I had my whole family home under our roof. We lived in a in a comfortable home. We had a walkable neighborhood. We were able to order food in. 
Um, we could have pizza night and movie night, and and then you'd you'd hear about these horror stories on the news of these small tenements in these places and COVID running rampant and people dying all over. And and then George Floyd was murdered up here in the United States. And that th those two events between the um, the pandemic starting and George Floyd's murder, I really just became so aware of the privilege that I had, and I just realized that if somebody like me isn't going to do something about making the world more just, and and in a faith perspective living the gospel message, uh, then what's going to happen? And that's what had me wander down the street to Villanova and, and enroll in a program of ministry and theology and decide to put this book to use. So I have a theory on privilege, and I haven't shared this on the podcast, so now that we're on the topic, um, and, and this will be quite offensive when I first say it, but it's not meant to be. I have a feeling that in some respects, privilege is by design because, because I was born in just outside London, right, as a white man, you know, and and I probably didn't have the the socio things that you had, but I had every opportunity to go get it, right? So there were very little barriers for me, right, to to go and to go and start a business and create wealth and have fun, and you know, I've now gone on to have one wife and three beautiful girls and and and, and moved to Australia and all that. So so privilege, but I think it's by design, and the only reason why I can say that is because God called me, right? I'm created. I'm a created person. So before the foundation of the earth, God says, I want this person and I'll give him these gifts and this talents and I'll, he'll be born in this country to these parents, right? By design. But I think that then it becomes, well, what's the response to our privilege? Right? Mm -hmm. So is it, it, now it's to be my brother's keeper, right? If, you know, the, the, the whole tenets of the gospel are prefer others over yourselves. If you want to take the book and for me, put it down to one sentence, prefer others over yourselves. So it's like, now I've got to work out, okay, is, is my privilege for me or is it for somebody else? So now I've got to turn that around and go, okay, well, who doesn't have that? That's got to be the center of my attention. And if, if everybody with privilege turned around to work out who the Lord would like them to help that doesn't have privilege, we'd have a great world today. I reckon. Yeah, amen to that. Amen. Luke 12, 48, everyone who much is given, that much is expected. And that that's on the bottom of my computer monitor and it, and it, it drives me every day. And if someone like me, and, and maybe I'll be presumptuous, someone like me or someone like you are not engaged in being our brother's keeper and in, in doing something for the least of these in trying to go and do likewise, whatever whatever the, the right scripture that fits the, the, the blank is, if, if we're not in motion, then I don't see how those people who are looking to get to a point of equity are going to get anywhere. And so I, I look at it as, you know, you mentioned values and you mentioned talents and gifts. For me, talents is another value. Uh, another core value, another core tenet is, you know, one of my real callings as a as a human, but as a, as a follower of Jesus, is discerning what are my unique talents and gifts. What part of the body am I? And and once I've discerned what those are, my call is to deploy those talents and gifts. That's what my ministry is. That's what my walk is meant to be. Is that's how I'm the arms and legs of Christ here on earth. Is if my talents and gifts happen to be X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C, then I need to go ahead and do those things as much as possible. So. I totally agree. And you would think that we've been friends for years because we have a very similar language around a lot of these things and yet quite a different background. Um, sure. You know, you know I, what we're talking about here, you mentioned, you know, Jesus is his earthly ministry. It's a little bit like Daniel too. I mean, you know, trained under the Chaldeans and, and sent out, like he was, he was a lover of God in a horribly corrupt world. But because of his secure faith and what he stood for, he went and, and, and led the charge. Massive outpouring of God, right? You know, if I, if I look at that and, and I look at your story, you know, 45,000 staff, like you would be rubbing up against, by default, some horrific stuff that you don't like and don't see and, and have to kind of infuse these values, you know, into this organization. And, and I just think about that. I'm like, that's what it's gonna take, I think, to, um, to, to turn the marketplace around. You know, hiving off and having another conference is is probably pretty cool for us to feel good to get a recharge. It's not going to change the marketplace, right? And um, and I think that's quite challenging for people. You know, they would have to go and get their hands really dirty, you know, to to be able to go and create that change. And surely you would too. Yeah, no, no, no doubt was. And and to me, I one of the things I very want to be very clear on. I don't know what the answers are. I I don't have a roadmap that says this is how we get to a place of, of realizing the kingdom or, or a place of, of you know, a, a rising economic tide taking all the boats with it. 
But what I do believe to my core is a, is a, is a very important way to get there is through dialogue and through reclaiming the lost art of civil discourse as a society. You know, because so much, again, as we talked about earlier, you know, whether it's politically, whether it's media pundits, whether it's the digital age and social media, and, and literally in some cases by, by algorithms, everything is, is preying on those relatively few things that, that separate us from each other, as opposed to the huge swaths of commonality we have all being created by God and in, in, in God's image. And so how do we recapture that lost art of dialogue? How do we disagree with each other without being disagreeable? So, you know, thinking about honoring stories and honoring, you know, the intersectionality of all the different things that go on to make up each one of our, of our infinitely fascinated personhoods. And knowing that we can have conversations with each other, we can seek to understand before, before being understood. Um, and, and just all the different things that can come along with the way of, of getting along without having to agree on everything. And that to me, again, I don't know what the solutions are, but I know if we can get more people doing that, we're going to be further towards a place that's better than where we are. And surely having a vehicle like Day and Zimmerman, um, you've got far more chances to infuse the kingdom than you do if you were to, you know, hive yourself off, you know, because one of the questions I would have would be like, because surely it hasn't been an easy run for you. Why wouldn't you just have listed this company? And you, you, you could have cashed out a long time ago had more money than you could ever need. You could have built a massive media company, be doing books and TV. You could have dominated, right? right, right. I, I guess I, look, I wrestle with that and I go, yeah. what, makes, what makes a guy like you go, I'm not tapping out, I'm, I'm, I'm staying in, right. you know? Right, no, that's a great question. And by the way, I, I, will, I would not say we could have dominated because I know what you do is not easy and what people who do in the, in the, the media space is, is challenging. But um, you know, you know we, we get asked that periodically and. Um, you know, it's just not a, a way that we're wired. Um, you know, we, as I said, we live economically comfortably, but um, we we invest very proudly and, and routinely the vast majority of our, of our proceeds back into the business because A, from a financial standpoint, it's the best place we can put our money in terms of getting a return. But, but B, and more importantly, we've got 45,000 employees. We've got their families. We've got thousands of customers and those customers' families and, the, and, and, and hundreds and hundreds of communities counting on the role that Day and Zimmerman plays to, to make the world better and to give people an opportunity to put food on the table, to achieve dignity, to grow in their careers, to make relationships. And, and that, that is at our core as, as a family, as a management team, as a company, as a culture. And it's something that is incredibly important to us. And there's, there's really no amount of money that would, that would replace that. So I personally really wanted you to share that because I'm like that, that for some people, that would be like, I haven't thought about my small business in that way, you know, and, mm -hmm. and if they can get that in them at, when it's a small business, yeah. they're far out, imagine what well, the world's you know, going to do. And, and I'll, I'll hear a lot of people talk about, you know, needing to do more of that volunteer work, but, but how truly, and I we talked about this earlier, how do you take what you do with the majority of your day and the majority of your week and the majority of your year and make that look like ministry and recognize this is what you're put on this earth to do. And this is where you're, you know, meant to make a difference in the world and a difference for other people and be your brother's keeper and help those who are who are on the margin who are oppressed. You can do all those things without, as I said, hanging Bible verses all over the wall. And, and you can do those things and, and realize who it is that you're meant to be. And that's that's enough. That's what, that's what we're asked to do right there. It's not anything more than that. Yeah, sure, go do the volunteering and the soup kitchens and all that. Yes, but 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 do that first thing and, and that's what you're asked to do. So good. All right, well, why don't you just riff for a minute, right? You know, there are people that listen to this podcast, you know, some of them might have a business doing, I don't know, 500 million. There'd be some people that are listening to this podcast that are doing, maybe they've just started, right? And they're in their first month of revenue. Um, just uh, just encourage them for a minute. I'll give you free reign. Just what would you say? They, they, you know, they might be driving right now or they're at a gym or they're, you know, on a treadmill or something, mowing the lawn. What would you what would you say to that? What do you say to those group of people? Yeah, no, it's a great thing, and I, I I'm humbled to be asked that question. Um, you know, because again, I I we have started business, but we, businesses, but we did not start a business. So we we you know dealt with a large business and, and continue to do that. Um, so I, I will be very careful to say that that I I would be remiss to give a lot of advice to true startups, to true entrepreneurs, because I have not really walked a mile in those shoes, but. You know, one of the things is is starting with what are your core values and and 
what's your vision for how you want to be professionally and how you want to make an impact on the world. And whether that's in your local community, whether that's something more broadly, whether that's in a, in a technology or digital space, but but if you're trying to do something that doesn't align with what your core personal values and your core life view is, you're, you're just not going to be satisfied. You're not going to be successful. Your loved ones are going to sense that you're not being authentic to yourself. In fact, one of the reasons why, you know, after my mom passed, why I pulled back from a lot of my management responsibilities, is I realized I was in a professional role that wasn't suiting me. It wasn't suiting my brothers. It wasn't suiting our management team. And so I was really doing people a disservice. And this isn't a business that I own. And so we changed my role and, and now I have, I, uh, I'm very engaged and thrilled with the, the connection I have with the business and the role that I play, but it was a matter of discernment and recognizing that I was in a place that didn't work. So, and also with that, with that say, I would say those people in business, it's important to have that faith lens and that light view, but you really have to look at the brass tacks of the business in a dispassionate way. You know, what is your value proposition? What's the competitive landscape look like? What's the buyer, the potential buyer market look like for what it is you're trying to bring to market? And if those real hardcore brass tack kind of elements are challenged or are, uh, you know, uh, going to be difficult to attain, then you know, it's going to take a lot of faith and a lot of providence to power through those those obstacles. So, did you say a dispassionate way? Yes. Yeah, that's awesome because it's yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't do a lot dispassionately either. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, because you're talking about just taking all the unnecessary rose glasses off, right? So that you actually see it for what it is, you know. And, and I think a lot of people struggle with that, like love for Jesus and the the practicalities of the marketplace, um, and 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 they come up with some strategies that needs providence to get them through instead of just market smarts. Yeah. And, um, yes. you know, that's why we're here trying to put out content as much as we can to kind of cover both bases. But, uh, but dispassionate is a, is a great way to say it. Um, all right, what's next for Bill, right? He's, he's kind of out of his day-to-day -day operations. He's, he's writing books. He's, he's guests on podcasts. What, what does the next season look like for you? Sure, yeah. And, it, it, you know, it's an exciting time for me right now because, uh, you know, the, 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 my, my business involvement will continue with Day and Zimmerman. I'm very happy about that. And, we're, you know, have, have a few members of the fourth generation have now joined us. And, and so we'll see what, what the future holds there and, and uh, with where unvarnished faith goes. And, uh, you know, I really do have a commitment towards um, issues of, of, of power dynamics, of privilege, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and so I started to talk with, uh, you know, a couple of different people about, you know, where, where can I get involved in more community building? Some of it may be in, in faith-based areas. Some may be more in secular environments, but issues about equity, about dignity, about dialogue, a number, number of the things we've talked about today apply very well in those areas. And, and um, so I'm in a discernment process. I'm really excited to see what the, what the Holy Spirit has in store. So uh, I finished my master's last year, put my book out just now, and it's a little daunting, a little exciting to say a year from now, I'm not sure what the lion's share of my professional uh, bandwidth will be occupied by. So. So we'll see. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, you've been a huge blessing to me on this podcast. I mean, one of the reasons why I do guest is for me and then everybody else gets to listen. Um, but, um, you know, when I think about, you've got this wonderful kind of matrix of all those years of scaling a big business, the lessons in there would be huge and the stories. And then you've got this, you know, passion for the kingdom and you're infused with this humility of, I don't have all the answers. I have a feeling that the Lord could do a lot with 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 that, and so you know, we'll, say, well, we'll have to check back. Yeah, we'll have to check back. Um, but yeah, you've been a real blessing to us. All right, guys, as we always do at the end of the podcast, it'll be tough this time to come up with the top one thing. Uh, you know, were you challenged? Were you stretched? Are you highly offended? If you're highly offended, feel free to put the comment in there too. We'll just delete it if it's really bad. Um, but, um, but I want to hear the feedback loop from you guys. You know, what did Bill share that really stirred something inside of you? There was a lot there and I'm sure there'll be at least one thing. So put it in the comments. Bill, thank you so much for your time. I know your time is super precious and, uh, and I'll be praying that your future, uh, just fulfills everything you want to do and your impact multiplies as you go. Great. Thank you, Wes. So, so, uh, honored to be here and God bless. Mm -hmm.